Bears game. Now I'm talking with Ed Lemer of UCLA about the recovery and the path of the economy. Ed, is this recovery different? What is your story? Well, it is different, but uh, but the last three recessions have been different, and the last three recoveries have been different, and that's a very, very important fact. This shows you uh, the first eight recessions since World War II. Okay, what you're looking at is a diagram that illustrates economic growth beginning with the cycle peak and ending at the end of an expansion. And the, the horizontal axis measures the number of quarters after the cycle peak. So at the extreme left, that's where the the peak begins, and the four indicates that we're four quarters into this uh, economic downturn or into the recovery, and on and on. It goes over to the right. And then the vertical axis measures the percent difference between GDP at any point in time compared to what it was at the cycle peak. You can see GDP, this is real GDP, it dipped down. And then you get this period of supernormal growth in which you get back to the 3% trend line. In fact, better than that. We've had 3% growth uh, uh, since uh, 1970, almost uh, for more than 40 years now. That's where we would be if we hadn't had that economic downturn. At least that's a measure of where we might have been. So the, the path that I want everybody to look for is dipping down below the where you were before, and then a period of supernormal growth in which you get back or you possibly in above that 3% trend line. That's a recovery. Okay, what about the last three? Let's, let's see how they look. They looked entirely different. So take a, take a look at this, the same kind of graph, except we have here the last three. So we have 1990, and it, 2001, and the 2007. Yeah, and remember that that's a reference to the cycle peak. So 2007 Q4 is a cycle peak. The first official recession quarter was the quarter after that, 2008 Q1. Right. So when you say the cycle peak, that's the beginning of the recession. So that's quarters right. from the start of the recession, the downturn, and then the recovery. Correct. So Let's start with the 1990 event. You can see that the decline wasn't very great compared to those uh, recessions that we were looking at a, a minute before, but we did dip down by, it looks like, about 1%, maybe 2%. And then we had economic growth, but it took a very, very long time to get back to that trend line. It took uh, 28 quarters or, Seven or, years. or more. Yeah, unbelievable. In the meantime, you're basically growing parallel to the 3%. And then the 2001 has exactly the same feature. Just dip down below that 3% trend, and you just continue even till the end of the expansion. If anything, you're getting a little farther from the 3% trend at the very end. So, so these the data are displayed from cycle peak to cycle peak. At the end of the or the data displayed, that's the end of that expansion. And you can see that there was no uh, no uh, recovery whatsoever. So that and the, fact, if, the that, fact that that the fact that that ends 27 quarters in that that line is because that's the end of that recovery. We get a new recession at that point. Correct. It's not and the really current bad. one is is. Um, it's worse in terms of its depth than the ones we've had before, but not so much more. This is 5% decline, you can see. And, um, but it's, by the way, that's nothing like the Great Depression, so we should stop the trash talk about this being the worst recession since the Great Depression because although it's technically true, it's rhetorically very misleading. This is a little worse than the ones we've had before. But what's different this time compared to the first eight is there's absolutely no recovery. There's no evidence of any recovery. If anything, the gap between the 3% trend line and where we are is getting bigger. That's because we've had over the last year or two, we've had only 2% growth, not 3% okay. growth. So this next image shows you the payroll information, payroll employment, in the same way from peak to, from peak to, to end of the expansion for the first eight recessions since World War II. And here I have a 1.5% trend. I mean, the, the normal GDP growth is composed of something like 1.5% increase in employment and about 2.5% um, uh, increase in productivity. So it's not a perfect line here, but it gives you a sense of where we ought to be. We ought to have payrolls growing at about 1.5% per year. And it's ellipse, just like we had before. That, that captures the recovery period. The reason that you get supernormal growth is because you're getting, in addition to the normal productivity growth, you're getting a surge of employment because you're putting people back to work. 
and this illustrates the putting people back to work in that uh, second and third year of after the cycle peak. And it, all these eight recessions had very strong job markets in their aftermath. And the, the horizontal axis here is not in quarters, as we've been looking at. It's in months. That's correct. Uh, so we're seeing a roughly three and a half years, three to four years into the recovery. We've made up all the job losses and then some uh, by that point for all these, almost every one of these uh, eight recessions after World War II, but the last three recessions you're going to argue are different. Yeah, so here's the image for the last three recessions, and we can go through them one on one. We had the 1990 event. I we didn't get back to trend until uh, 72 months into this thing, six, seven, or eight years. The 2001, the same thing. Never made you up see, the gap. And then, and then finally, where we are today. It, the the job loss is the most extreme since World War II, that's for sure. But the critical thing is no recovery. It looks like it's going to take seven or eight years just to get back to where we were before. So what's your explanation for why these last three recoveries have been so different? So the critical thing is all three are here. It's not just this most recent one. Everybody says this one is different. But if you're Sherlock Holmes, you've got to recognize the last three have been different. You better have a story that applies to all three, not just the one that we're in now. So our take on this is that the normal job market has temporary layoffs followed by recalls, where the individuals go back to this, exactly the same job they had before the recession. But in every one of these downturns, there are some permanent displacements where workers lose their jobs and they have no prospect of ever getting back that same job again. And these permanently displaced workers have to change, possibly change locations, have to change skills, and probably most of all have to change aspirations because the job they're going to is likely to pay less than the job that they've had. So if we could look at this uh, next image, which illustrates the payroll jobs in manufacturing, what I've said about temporary layoffs followed by recalls is exhibited very, very clearly by these V-shaped cycles. The, what we have here is the, the official recessions are shaded. And there you can see that the payroll jobs are up and down. Uh, it's a very short life problem. You lose a couple million jobs within one year and you get them all back within another year. That's temporary layoffs followed by recalls. So if you go through this, let your eyes swing across these recessions, you'll see it's all VV. The first one was different was the 1990 event. That was a U. And you can see we didn't really get any kind of uh, return of those manufacturing jobs until the after 1995 when when the the internet uh, rush was on then the next downturn was a strict L which we lost a couple million jobs and none of them came back and here we're in a kind of a lazy L the last one here on the right is a kind of lazy L we're having some improvement in manufacturing that's mostly autos and durables but uh, <clears throat> Overall, it's been a very, very uh, weak recovery with regard to uh, uh, manufacturing payroll. So we're so we're seeing since uh, 1990 permanent displacements in manufacturing. These are not workers who have been temporarily laid off and can expect to be rehired. They're permanently displaced. But a long, steady upward trend uh, up to about 1980, and then it peaks in absolute numbers there. Um, and then it falls not only as a proportion of total employment, but in absolute numbers, all basically in the last 30 years. Well, it changes fundamentally the the, the uh, job cycle in manufacturing, which I've illustrated in this next figure, with uh, which describes the cost cutting plus the trend. And and the cost cutting that you see in this image has um, a, a, a kind of a half of a V, in which there's a very strong first stroke in which you lay off a lot of workers, the second stroke is a little bit lazy because you don't hire everybody back. Uh, that's because you're getting a productivity gain in these economic downturns. They're an opportunity for employers to improve productivity by identifying workers that were not contributing as much as they might have. So the normal cost cutting produces a kind of, of, of uh, partial V but if, if that partial V, if you if you take that partial V and you add a specular trend, which you see here at the top, then you get the V-shaped cycle, the happy cycle, in which you have temporary layoffs followed by recalls. And uh, these are short-lived events that the maybe fiscal policy or monetary policy take credit for, but really it's mostly that 
mostly the fact that they're timed when the recalls are occurring. But if you have the the bottom display in which the cost cutting, which kills off jobs, if you add to that a negative sector trend, then you get the kind of lazy L that we have now. That means that there's a couple million manufacturing workers, a lot of them centered in the Midwest, whose jobs are, have disappeared, and they have to make this very difficult decisions as to what their next job is going to be. But in addition, we have excess. We had excess capacity in construction, because at the peak of the cycle, we had 2.2 million units being produced, uh, new homes, and we the number of homes that is normal is only one and a half million. So that ratio, 2.2 to one and a half, that represents excess capacity in construction. That's probably another two million workers. It is. So by our reckoning, we've got a record number in excess of 5 million, maybe as many as 6 million permanently displaced workers. And the, dealing with that pathology is extremely difficult. It's not amenable to either fiscal or monetary policy. You, you, you might look at this and say, well, wow, the manufacturing sector has just obviously collapsed in the United States. But actually, manufacturing output has risen dramatically in the last 20 and 30 years. What we're seeing here in this fall in employment in terms of numbers of people is the incredible productivity that's come to the manufacturing center, sector so that more can be produced with absolutely fewer people, not just more per worker, but enough more per worker that you can get more with fewer workers. Well, I agree that the predominant force is technological change, but there's also a, con a contribution from globalization as well. For sure. But part of that, that's th the, the point I want to emphasize is the manufacturing sector itself is very healthy in the output side. So getting these jobs back, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, you want to think about there being robots. There are robots who are lining up the HR departments of every manufacturing facility. They're offering to do the jobs that humans are trying to compete for as well. And the, and the manufacturers are finding the robots are a lot more productive than the humans. So what's the solution? We've got these downturns with very disappointing employment uh, recoveries, which is what we will ultimately care about, is people's lives. Uh, you've made the point that fiscal and monetary policy is unlikely to solve that problem. Where might a solution come from? Well, there's one more thing. It's not just robots that are changing the nature of the job market. They're, they're affecting manufacturing, but it's also microprocessors. The microprocessors are just marching through our labor markets. Anything that's mundane, codifiable, programmable, any task like that is going to be done either by faraway foreigners, by robots, or microprocessors. And the implication is that we need a workforce that's suited to the reality of the 21st century. We need an educational system that doesn't produce the human equivalent of robots, but that the, but the kinds of humans who are able to do the creative, problem-solving, analytical thinking tasks that the 21st century is demanding. Now, if John Taylor were here, and we, of course, interviewed him in a multi-part series earlier on the numbers game, he'd say that two of the last three recoveries were mediocre because they were just mild dips. What determines the pace of the recovery and its speed is how deep or shallow was the initial recession. And he argues that the recession in 2007 should have been a large and quick bounce back because it was a deep uh, recession. The fact that it didn't, he blames the fiscal and monetary policy that you're suggesting is irrelevant. Well, I, I think that um, <clears throat> there's two two responses. One is the housing market is going to recover, but it's been very slow to recover, and we're going to see improved in, improvements in the housing market this year. They're ongoing. They're, some of the sluggishness is is the is the very delayed uh, recovery when it comes to housing, but I I do not think the rest of it is attributable to um, Washington, D.C., I think that way overstates the importance of, of our government in determining economic growth. And I think it's fundamentally a Main Street problem. In the 20th century, uh, inputs and outputs were growing together. But in the 21st century, in the United States, it's been all output growth. There's been no input growth, no increase in hours. And, and that has to do with the microprocessor. We're in an era of technological change, creative destruction, if you want to put it that way, where the microprocessor is killing off a critical asset that drove growth in the 20th century. That's our high school education. We, the creativity of the, of the microprocessor is causing a destruction of those old assets. We need to recognize that, write it off, 
and start creating the assets or supporting the investments that will help the economy grow in the 21st century. So for those of us who uh, don't compete with microprocessors as much, uh, it's been a boon. It's been a wonderful thing. We have all these great gadgets, and that productivity increase due to microprocessors is being transformed into a higher standard of living. But for people who do compete with them, who are relatively unskilled, people without a high school education and even some with, you're saying they're, uh, they're struggling. They're terribly struggling. And with very low employment to population ratios and uh, very, very few prospects, really. It's a sad situation. My guest today has been Ed Lemer. Ed, thanks for being on The Numbers Game. Thank you, Russ. It's always great to be with you.